Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's FS Club webinar uh, from here in London. And all the way on the far side of London in Mayfair uh, is Simon, uh, who is dialing in uh, for, as the partner and CEO from Finlay Park Partners. Um, for those regular viewers, you'll be surprised, but I am actually in my residence at the Old Bailey today. And I'm absolutely delighted as uh, chairman of Zian to be able to introduce so many of these interesting webinars. And today's is uh, particularly interesting to me uh, because uh, many of our sponsors are often asking, well, you know, what's, what's going on? What, what does FS Club help us to achieve? And what we try and unite, of course, is technology, economics, and finance. And we can only do that thanks to the generosity and may I say tolerance of our sponsors. So we're gonna take a small historical dive Simon and his team are modern financiers. They manage uh, well over $15 billion, and they're very committed to the U.S. markets, and he'll explain a bit more about that. But the key thing that they try and do at Finley Park is not to lose value. And uh, far too many people, uh, I think, look at investment as making money. And actually, when you talk to most of the larger asset and investment managers, the job is not to lose it. And that's what I care about as a pensioner. So I think that's important. To do so, and to do so well, they need to examine these little corners and to see what they can learn. And Simon will be explaining the background to that. Now, my job is to get out of the way so that you can hear from Simon why a firm like his is interested in this strange bit of history in America, which, funnily enough, I lived through in the States, and so I, too, am interested in what, what, what they thought went on. Um, so he'll be speaking for about 20 minutes, and then, as ever, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A, where we count upon you to send us comments, observations, anecdotes, and most particularly questions. And in those questions, I'll be feeding them into a conversation with Simon. So three points of note. Uh, firstly, yes, all the slides will be available, in fact, may well be available now. Uh, secondly, the recording will be up and available in approximately two working days, so uh, hopefully uh, Friday afternoon. And finally, and most importantly, yes, we do want your questions. All of them will be sent to Simon and his team. Uh, if there's a question detail Simon doesn't quite have the answer to, it'll come with your email attached to it uh, so that, that, that he can respond to that. However, a word of warning, please do use the GoToWebinar question and answer facility. Uh, a number of people have over time uh, WhatsApp to have signaled, uh, messaged, uh, emailed me, uh, LinkedIn to me, and all sorts of things. It's really great, folks. I appreciate it. But I'm here with you, and so I won't get those until after it's done. So please use the chat facility so we can incorporate your thinking into this presentation. Well, that's that's uh, enough from me. Uh, Simon, you are the expert, and I'm really looking forward to this. So over to you. Michael, thank you, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to the FS Club today. Um, I'll begin with a couple of comments. First of all, my, my compliance officer makes me say, uh, this is not financial advice. Um, so having got that over, I'll move on with the historical project that we've got here. Um, I'll also say that um, much of this work has been done by Joseph von Zanten, who is a financial historian who's been working with us the last nine months and unfortunately is unwell today. Um, so very hard technical questions might be taken by email and passed on to him afterwards. Um, but without further ado, I'll move on into the body of the subject. And perhaps a good place to begin is you know, why, why we, did we decide to look at the Nifty 50? Um, and on reflection, I decided the Nifty 50 was a phrase I, I'd thrown around quite a lot. Um, I, I'm not the only one. We've got a couple of recent headlines here uh, questioning whether the fangs, these five big tech stocks that dominate today's market, are like the Nifty 50. And on reflection, uh, when I talked about it with my fellow partners at Finney Park, we thought, well, what do we actually know about the Nifty 50? And our answer was, well, not, not very much. So, so let's, let's get into it. Um, and it's been interesting what we've discovered as we've made our way through. I, I had this sort of you know, vague feeling that the Nifty 50 had done well and then disappointed. Um, there's some disagreement ar ar around this. Um, you'll see we've created a couple of uh, leading global equity managers here um, who, who both uh, had the view that, that actually the Nifty 50 did quite well. Um, uh, and not nearly as badly uh, as, as its reputation might suggest. So we've tried to get into the weeds. We, we've looked at the data uh, of these stocks in this group of Nifty 50 uh, 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 holdings uh, and tried to understand how they performed over the last 40 years. 
And what were some of the drivers going on um, in the 70s? And then perhaps crucially, can we learn anything that's relevant to today's um, market? So we, moving on, um, we're going to talk a bit about you know, were the Nifty 50 overvalued? Um, and there's a question coming up a bit later. We're interested to take the temperature of, of, of the, uh, the audience on this. Um, yeah, moving on, um, you know, what, where we probably need to begin here is you know, defining what was the Nifty 50. And one of the first lessons we learned is there was no agreed group of what the Nifty 50 were. Um, there's a broad sort of understanding of uh, these were stocks offering superior growth. Um, many of them came with pretty high price earnings multiples. Um, and they were being ardently supported by major banks, portfolio managers, and one bank in particular, the Morgan Guarantee Company, which I'll, I'll come on to. Um, and we've got a quote here, which is the first reference that we can find to the Nifty 50, which is in the New York Times in, in December 1973. And a lot of our, our sources here have been from contemporary journalism. Um, I mean, interestingly, there are very few academic papers that have really dug into this area. And most of those that we have found are written by economists rather than um, financial historians. So we've got this group, the Nifty 50. Um, and, and when we look at sort of the journals of the time, we can find that this was by no means the only use of sobriquet applied. Um, one decision stocks, uh, I particularly like super stocks, uh, religion stocks, um, and the favored 50, which I believe was the term most associated with the Morgan uh, Guarantee Company. But there is no official list. Um, but but if, we, if we go to the next one, we can see that you know, there's an interview we're most intimately associated with the Morgan Guarantee Trust Company. This is, if you like, you know, the Goliath uh, of investments uh, in, in the early 70s. Um, and, and it's one of those sort of uh, investors where uh, others tend to look at it. Um, you know, I, I sort of draw a loose comparison with the Norwegian pension fund. The same investors in Europe just look at what the Norwegian pension fund is doing uh, and follow it. This is that kind of thing on a much bigger scale. Uh, and what we've listed here are Morgan, Stan Morgan Guarantee's sort of favorite 50. Um, so some of these names will be familiar. Uh, we've got Johnson Johnson, Procter & Gamble, uh, Walt Disney. Uh, others are going to form a giant that have disappeared, you know, Eastman Kodak, Sears Roebuck, Polaroid. Um, one or two I had to look up, uh, you know, Simplicity Patterns, um, this was a manufacturer of sewing pattern guides, uh, came out of the Great Depression where you'd sort of order your sort of pattern guide uh, for making your homemade clothes, that was one of the, the Nifty 50. And it's still around, if anyone is a keen sewer, uh, I can connect you with their their current sort of offering. Um, so this is kind of the group that we're looking at. Uh, and, and most of these names appear on most people's lists of companies. Um, now behind this list, we've also got to talk about a person. Um, and the big champion of the Nifty 50 is Carl Hathaway. Carl Hathaway is the senior vice president of Morgan Guarantee. Uh, pretty strong views. Quoted here in the Wall Street Journal, the greater fool in growth stocks isn't the one who buys them, but the one who sells them. Now his mantra is, you know, find these great companies, you know, own them, own them forever because nothing can go wrong. Um, we'll see if that turned out to be um, the case. Interestingly, when he made that statement, the, the bull market was already over and, and the bear market had, had begun. Um, shortly after making that statement, Morgan Guarantee Trust moved into their swanky new headquarters. Uh, many of you have heard the aphorism, the time to sell a stock is when they move into new headquarters. Um, we've got a photo here on the right, um, and uh, another quote from uh, another quote there. The favorite 50 are relatively easy. Uh, large chief analysts, you know, family stocks. Uh, this stuff is easy. Um, so where do we get next? Perhaps in some context for where these stocks have come from. And the chart here is showing the S&P index from 1960. Uh, so a relatively strong market through most of the 60s, this sort of uh, real bull market takeoff in uh, 66 to 68, we saw a lot of IPOs, uh, emissions around that period, um, 
uh, some creative accounting, mergers, your concept stocks. And then we hit 68 to 70 when, when a lot of that stuff blew up. Um, and this, this kind of, of feeble background created the appetite for the nifty 50, a sort of an appetite for, for apparent certainty. Um, and if we move on. Um, so, so here, here was the sort of Morgan Guarantees philosophy, which, which, which came across and made a lot of sense in 1970. They were looking for you know, long run investments, uh, not a kind of short term yield. Uh, they were looking for recession proof companies, those able to maintain growth uh, even during downturns. And, and crucially, taking these two points, they were focusing on companies that have survived the, the 68 to 70 bear market relatively unscathed. So they were using their kind of rear view mirror uh, to judge future success. Um, and form this list of, of stocks. And that, that explanation of philosophy comes again from a Wall Street Journal interview that Hathaway gave in 1973. Um, another great advantage Morgan Guarantee had, um, it didn't really need to sell stocks because it had this extraordinary for the time $1 billion inflow of fresh funds every year. They're storming into its funds. So it, it had the opposite problem. It had to deploy money rather than meet redemptions. Uh, and, and these flows were steadily flowed into these, um, these nifty 50 stocks. Um, so how did the wider uh, marketplace react? Um, uh, I, I've got a few sheep at home, so I always like to have a photo of sheep somewhere in my presentation. Um, and, and we see herd behavior. Uh, we, we see um, you know, another quote from the Wall Street, General, uh, Wall Street Journal, 26th of January, 73, you can buy with conviction stocks with super price earnings multiples on the theory that banks and pension fund trusts will continue to fatten their portfolios with these securities regardless of the price. So you've got this sort of great kind of following wind behind this stuff. You can't go wrong. Follow Morgan Guarantee. Uh, and indeed, that's what the herd does. They, 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 um, they follow behind. But there's even uh, some retail investor interest. Uh, Citibank launches a vehicle basically to mirror what Morgan Guarantee are doing. Um, I, I found some you know, interesting echoes there. We're seeing um, a, a lot of stuff at the moment about how can retail investors ex, uh, enter, enter sort of um, more esoteric, uh, illiquid markets like private equity. You know, it always raises the question when the retail market has been found a way in, and, and that's starting to happen in, in, in 1973 uh, with, with this sort of uh, the Citibank uh, exchange traded fund. Um, so, so what happens to the stocks? Well, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, they become a larger and larger percentage of the S&P. Uh, and, and you can see roughly over that sort of, uh, you know, sort of three-year period from the late 69-70, uh, they're doubling as a proportion of the S&P market cap. Um, and the flip side of that is what happens with the rest of the market. Um, so this shows the value line index, which is an equal weighted index uh, it peaks in November 68, uh, makes a very small advance in, in 1970-71, but then declines. So while the rest of the market is declining, the Nifty 50 are kind of powering ahead through 72 and 73. Um, the next slide, we can uh, see a lot of multicolored lines, but that, that gives you a sort of cluster of all those individual stocks. And you can see there's some variation. Um, the direction generally is upward, with one or two sort of exceptions, but a lot of really quite extraordinary moves in capital return through that three-year period. Okay, next slide. Um, so you now we then get to what, what perhaps you know, looks with the moment of hindsight as a pivotal moment, again with some echoes uh, for today. Um, the, the concept of concept stocks, you know, the largest stock in the world at the time, IBM, uh, is found guilty in September 73 of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. So regulation jumps in on big tech and investors start to worry that maybe the US government is putting a limit on, on how big these things can get. And just maybe if that sort of growth stocks value is in doubt, maybe the other stocks need to be looked at uh, afresh. Um, 
So we've got a, got a Barron's article there talking about how one by one the sickening stars fade from ethereal plane. Those are the days where Barron quoted from poets like Alexander Pope, which you don't see quite as much uh, these days. Um, so where do we go from there? Um, uh, next job, please. Um, so fear becomes a bit contagious. Um, uh, sorry, we could flip that one. Um, we, we see institutions moving away, the herd-like behavior continues, shifting, I suppose, in today's parlance from growth stocks into cyclicals. Um, the S&P falls because it's so full of nifty 50 stocks anyway, and it's overall weighting. And this then is kind of sort of turbocharged through the OPEC oil embargo uh, in, in October 73. Um, I, I think this is my favorite quote we've discovered uh, from Barron's in October. Um, Inflated multiples suddenly are as suspect as a crew cut at a rock festival. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't know, but apparently we didn't see many crew cuts at rock festivals in the 70s. Uh, maybe others on the call can help me out on that one. Um, so the next chart is showing really the reverse of the chart a few charts ago. This is um, prices moving pretty dramatically in the other direction. Again, quite a lot of variation, and we'll come on to that but a general real downward shift uh, underperforming the rest of the market. Um, how in Morgan guarantees sort of reacting to this? Well, initially they are very much sort of giving a steady issue goes message, um, acknowledging that it's not been a great year, um, but at the same time, hanging on to what they've been invested in. Uh, next slide. Um, and Carl Hathaway, uh, my second favorite quote, this is Carl Hathaway reflecting on the experience 20 years later, you know, how does he sleep at night? You know, it's easy, I sleep like a baby, I sleep for 30 minutes and wake up and cry for 30 minutes. Um, and, and this is really kind of catastrophic for more gravity. It, it created the reputations of managers, for them as an institution. It's one of those kind of pivotal moments really in US uh, investment history reflecting back a, a, a critical error in, in judgment. Um, uh, now, yeah, as we find the reverse happens to all that money flowing in, suddenly trying to get out of these stocks, uh, they tend to be not as liquid uh, as anticipated, and it takes quite a lot of time. And this sort of selling process continues uh, through the 70s, uh, and other bank trust departments are on their way out um, uh, as well. And over time, and this, this is, we've, we've run the data of reach of 2020, you can see the nifty 50s uh, and then percentages of the S&P falls down to, at the end of 2020, it's sort of roughly you know, just below 10%. Um, you know, a couple of caveats with that, you know, some stocks have been acquired, uh, some have gone bust, but it gives you a good sense of that direction of travel over the long term. Um, so let's get into stock specifics. Uh, so, so you hear the survivors, so these are the uh, nifty 23, not quite as catchy, but survivors today. Um, some very large companies right at the top of the list, very familiar. Um, some are hanging on, are now members of the you know, Russell 2000 small cap index at the bottom, but, but they're the survivors, you know, quite, a, quite a spread, and in total still worth over $3 trillion in, in, in market cap. And coming towards the question of were these stocks overvalued, you know, looking through the rearview mirror, um, here we've sort of tried to map the kind of annualized returns. Perhaps we just flip back a chart. Uh, um, we've tried to map the sort of annualized returns over that sort of 40 year period. You can see the SP is there about 10.5% uh, compound annual return. Um, a fair few of these stocks are just above that. In one or two cases, they are some way above it but you know, the majority are below, and in some cases, you know, well below. Um, that's a good point for a, a question, I think, to the audience, so I'll hand back to Michael. Well, thank you, Simon. I wish Barron's wrote uh, that way today. I mean, the amazing yeah. stuff, the Vestal Virgins and the Sunday Temperance Afternoon. So the, the straightforward question that Simon wants you to answer is, were the Nifty 50 overvalued? And you can see the poll in front of you there. Uh, yes, ridiculously overvalued, slightly, slightly fairly valued, completely fairly valued, or you don't know. 
Uh, and the audience, as, as ever, Simon, they're very uh, opinionated and swift and very smart. Uh, over 50 have voted. I'm going to leave it open for just a little bit longer. Um, there we go. I'm getting up here. And I'm just about to close that poll, which I'm doing now. And I will launch the uh, results. Well, there you go. Um, the audience in, 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 in some respects basically think, and that's 79%, uh, it was overvalued and 37% ridiculously overvalued. So back to you, Simon. Michael, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think we'd probably place ourselves uh, somewhere between the green and the red bar at the top. Um, so 16 of these companies have outperformed the S&P since that 70 peak. Nine have resulted in absolute losses if one had hold them all the way through the period, which is quite a result given the, the stock market we've seen the past four decades. But I, I think we feel we can say conclusively as a group, they were overvalued relative to the rest of the market. Um, and, and you can see here, and I think you know, one, one thing we then try to look at, again, this is looking at the lessons we can learn. Well, what valuations were these sort of stocks uh, trading at? back in 73, how much information was there in that valuation? Um, and, and while we can sort of say, you know, the best performers had slightly lower price earnings multiples um, than average, they were still much higher than the S&P. Um, and some of those best performing stocks were significantly higher in price earnings terms. So the broad conclusion we take from this is, you know, the, the PE alone is not a good indicator of, of, uh, of future future returns, or something wasn't in this case. The next chart kind of plots this. Um, uh, for those of you on a more mathematical inclination of me, you can see the R squared there is very low. Um, this is plotting against the 1973 price earnings multiple on one side, and the total return or, or the, the analyzed total return or loss uh, underneath. Um, and there really is a very low correlation between that valuation starting point and, and subsequent return. Um, so I think the tentative conclusion we've drawn from this is quality growth can look expensive, but can be well worth the price. Uh, and some of these companies would fall into that sort of quality growth. Uh, you know, another word one might use here is sustainable. Um, the duration of returns these businesses were able to generate uh, over subsequent decades, which more than justified that starting valuation. The flip side was, you know, some businesses weren't sustainable, uh, weren't, didn't have that duration of returns, uh, and starting from a low basis, low PE P -P multiple, uh, didn't do terribly well. Um, and, and a quote that, you know, from one of our favorite investors, we, we, tend, to, we tend to use a lot here, um, but very relevant here, you know, high multiple, not necessarily mean a stock's a price, Charlie Munger of Berkshire Hathaway will say, you know, over the long term, it's hard for a stock to earn a much better return than the business which underlie, underlies it earns. So you know, the example of the business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, you can pay a lot of money for it, but you'll probably end up okay. Um, that, 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 that quality of return and duration of that return is really a key factor. Um, so you know, how did Morgan guarantee with all these kind of 50 analysts, how do they get it so wrong? Um, uh, you know, what, they were certainly confident, but, but perhaps overconfident in the wrong thing. Um, they thought they discovered a recession-proof company. Um, and, and as I've already hinted at, they focused almost myopically on the performance in this immediate downturn, the 68 to 1970. Um, and, uh, and as anyone who tried to compare the downturn Last year, through COVID, uh, brief that it was with the 2007-2008 downturn, um, the lessons don't always bear over from one to another. You know, every downturn is different. Um, and the second one is that sort of, you know, past performance is really no guarantee of future results. Um, something every good fund manager has in their disclosure, but is true of stocks uh, as well. Um, another interesting, the, the contemporary uh, journalist uh, in the studies blamed uh, the problem on was actually on technology. We'd just begun to see you know, computers being used by investors, uh, uh, and I, I, I don't think one can blame technology. Um, but what I would say is, and it reminds me of you know, the financial historian Russell Napier, who, who, who has a great saying that you know, 
extrapolation is the opiate of the people. Um, I, I think extrapolation of the past into the future is the problem. And unfortunately, the Excel spreadsheet has allowed people to extrapolate at will. Um, and we are, we are seeing here, I suppose, the beginnings of technology-driven extrapolation. Uh, and there was perhaps some of that going on with the analysis uh, at Morgan Guarantee. Um, so the market, you know, we saw this heading following following Morgan's lead, you know, buying stocks, because others were buying, not doing their own fundamental analysis. They're pressing for an echo here. Um, you know, we're, passive, passive investing, I guess, didn't exist 40 years ago, now a very large feature of the market. Uh, you know, a large part of the market that that that, that is just following. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the benchmark rather than a key market participant, but but not not basing their investment on fundamental analysis. So summing that up, you know, these are some of the lessons I suppose we've tried to pull together from this. You know, there's a lot more to value uh, than P multiples. Quality growth can be worth a high price. Um, Emotions and marriages can move markets in the short term, both up and down. And interestingly, we saw that trigger event with IBM when the regulators came in. Uh, even when that, that regulation threat then was removed, IBM stock didn't recover. Uh, the emotional narrative had moved in the other direction. Um, and this last point, you know, no stock really, really can be a one decision stock. I mean, companies change. Uh, even when they remain in the same kind of business, companies evolve and change, uh, and investors need to keep an eye on them. And sometimes these changes can be positive, and sometimes they can be extremely negative. But but the buy and forget stocks are, are really few and, and far far between. Uh, I'll end on the example of Polaroid. Uh, I was amused to see my children told me Polaroid cameras have made a, a comeback. Um, Stock, not so much. That's definitely one no longer with us. Next, next slide, please. And, and you can see the total return has not been a happy experience, but there have been some you know, positive bumps along the way. Uh, so our, our final conclusion, I suppose, uh, you know, we, we have a process that's based around trying to identify uh, genuine quality stocks, sustainable uh, investment, um, and our aim is to not sleep like a baby in the collateral sense of sleeping for 30 minutes and then waking up and crying every 30 minutes. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, it'd be fascinating to have some questions, uh, and well, those I can answer, be happy to follow up on. Thank you so much for that, Simon. That was absolutely fascinating. Fear not, there are many, many questions, so we won't be able to get to quite through everything. Um, just a quick one. Uh, we've got an observation from both Chris David and from John Spain that uh, it does look a, that the Nifty 50 was quite skewed towards big pharma. Would that be fair? Yes, and there's some interesting skews uh, in that. I wonder if we can just get that slide back up um, near the beginning of the deck. Yeah, we'll have a look at that. And of course, a little supplementary from Chris uh, David. He sort of, and there seemed to be an absence of banks and financial services companies. So just maybe some yes. remarks on the composition. Yeah, I and mean, I think that reflects the, uh, again, it's the looking through the recent rearview mirror into what had happened in 68 and 1970. Um, and uh, then as now, banks were seen as, as, as far more cyclical companies. Um, at, at the whim of uh, interest rates, as much as, as individual stock fundamentals. Um, and, and Morgan Guarantee's favorite 50 here, it was trying to look, I suppose, for, uh, I think what they thought they'd done is identify businesses that could go cross cycles. Um, and financials didn't really fit into that. Okay. Um, now, Chris David again, um, you know, we we're chatting there about uh, Carl Hathaway. Um, how does uh, the Nifty 50 compare to the Warren Buffett approach to investing? Um, it, yes, it's a, it's a good question uh, and worthy of a much longer answer. Um, I, I think sort of the, the immediate superficial, super, super, or superficial sort of uh, similarity would be this duration of, of holding a stock. Uh, you know, what Warren Buffett is famous for saying is 
his favorite holding period is forever. Um, uh, the sim simplistic differential would be what they bought. <laughs> Uh, and interesting, actually, of course, Warren Buffett does invest in financial stocks, um, so he casts his net pretty broadly. Um, but I, I, I think it, it boils down into that analysis of, of, of what is being owned um, uh, and uh, what, what's actually in the portfolio. Um, we have a, we have two two comments here. I think it might be kind of interesting, and you know, perhaps an opportunity as well to explain Finley Park's interests. Charles Vermont says, do you think it is possible to pick stocks or is the key allocation by country and sector? Uh, and John Falk says, it looks like you can pick all stocks, just invest in the S&P 500. So some comments on that would be useful. Yes, I mean, of course, there, there is a, uh, a very strong school of thought, uh, which has been um, as echoed out of the, the Ellen Diamond, um uh, a team uh, around the US and across the world that you know, for, for certainly large cap US, you should just go passive. Um, uh, I, I'm probably not in a position to give an unbiased answer uh, as CEO of an active manager in US equities, um, but by definition, we, we believe something to the contrary. Um, uh, I, I think you know, what, what we would say is um, uh, uh, there is a role for, for active active management, but it's it, it's it's for the, the, the buyer, buyer to decide and determine. Um, I, I think comparing the US to the rest of the world, again, I, I put my hand up and say we are a US equity manager uh, and the rest of the world are less familiar with. Um, perhaps one point I would make uh, for anyone to something to look at comparing the US to the rest of the world is, again, there's a danger of simplistic comparisons. Um, the US always screens as a, a much higher PE than other global equity markets. But the composition of the US uh, is very different. Um, and perhaps one factor to look at, uh, which has become really important the last few years, is, is this sort of uh, this profile of um, uh, very high free cash flow margin, um, very high growth companies, many of them in the technology sector. Um, and, and these have warranted uh, higher valuations, you know, looking through the rear view mirror. So I, I always point anyone doing a kind of cross market comparison, look at, look at the components first uh, as you dig in to, to what you're getting in markets. It's quite different. OK, um, let me have a look at uh, two other areas. Uh, we touched briefly at the very beginning on what I think is often called the FANGs, although there are many other acronyms, but basically the big five tech stocks. Um, you know, is that, where does that comparison fit and where does it not fit, in your opinion? John Falk. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, it's that whole sort of you know, history sort of rhyming but not repeating. Um, I, I know when sort of Joseph uh, first showed me his work on IBM, I was leaping around the room thinking, wow, this sounds just like, you know, FANG and regulation. And uh, I, I was leaping to, to make, a, make a connection. Um, I, I, I think it is still interesting. I, if we look not just across the looking at banks today, but at other periods in US financial history when one sector has become dominant, regulation has tended to step in. Um, and we can see several junctures where that's happened. So I, I think it's something that investors today should definitely be cognizant of um, the, the regulation uh, breaking off monopoly uh, risk. And, and, and you know, one way to start looking at the FANGs today is uh, company by company, how vulnerable each is to uh, uh, break up uh, what that would do to their business business models um, and, and where else the regulation might strike. I, I think you can argue the FANGs have had a pretty good ride when it comes to regulation and been quite lightly regulated. Of course, huge debate now about um, uh, their responsibility for content having had the sort of, you know, free pass on this uh, for a couple of decades. Um, but I think that's one area that one would look. I think one area that, that, that is, again, interesting to look at, but there are differences, I and mean, all these 50 companies were profitable. Uh, if we look back to 71, 72. Um, looking across at the tech companies today, it, you know, the, these have been very profitable businesses. Um, coming back again to the, the growth rate, you know, there aren't that many companies that generate 15% uh, per annum or more growth year after year, and they fall into that category um, and have very high free cash flow margins. Uh, 
still generating you know, taking market share, still generating that growth. So there, there has been some logical basis for focus in that, that area. Um, again, where I would point someone towards wanting to do more work comparing today's market and this market is sustainability. Yeah, how sustainable are, are, are these businesses? And one can learn something about the lack of sustainability in some of these businesses to fail. Yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a really good point you make about regulation because I think a lot of people forget the baby bell period uh, back in the early yeah. 80s, which which exhibited that. So Christensen rules on IBM, but then I think it's almost exactly a decade later the baby bells hit. Uh, we didn't really have a dot com regulatory bit, but we do have regulatory yeah. bits facing us uh, not just in, in banking and and big tech on data, but also of course pharma, which is now going through yeah. a regulatory pricing issue there. And I, and I think as well as sustainability, we're going to start seeing sustainability being more regulated and firms that are exposed, the dirtier firms are going to see regulation hitting. So that's a really good point. Um, a couple of things I might uh, might add to the conversation here. Um, Chris David, again, uh, what would a new Nifty 50 look like today? Yeah, a, a good question. And I don't have a definitive answer yet. Um, we have set it up actually as the next stage of the task here um, to, to create a sort of a, a new Nifty 50. Um, but but I, I, I don't have a, a definitive answer. I mean, I think you know, one way we thought about it is do you just start with, um, given the dominance of, of passive investing, particularly in US equities, do you just say today's Nifty 50 is the biggest 50 stocks in the index? Um, uh, if we're trying to draw a parallel with you know, people following the guarantee and now they follow the index. Um, so that's one way we're, we're considering it. Um, but we, we're, we're working through one or two other ideas, uh, ideas as well uh, to do that. Uh, actually, our most recent exercise, we've just competed in this area. We've looked at how the, the, the 50 best performing stocks um, since 2008. For this sort of period since that 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 sort of financial crash, uh, what what's what's sort of um, performed best, um, and that, that that's quite interesting data. I mean, it, it's a real mix of sectors with some surprises in, um, but but the diversity of sectors is one thing that really struck us about that. Okay, um, you sparked interest here. Angel Gaviero is going up a similar line. The Nifty 50 weight over the S&P chart was 40% of peak, and then plateaus for decades of 20% until dot com, so maybe a 73 to 95 analysis as a start, et cetera. Um, Kartik Patel uh, says that the Nifty 50 index in India post COVID has dramatically risen. Is it the making of another bubble? Um, I'd like to ask you two questions, if I may. Um, there are two things uh, kind of missing from the presentation uh, that I'd just like to ask. About. One is about volatility. I didn't see volatility or sharp ratios. Did you have any observations on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it, the, the short answer is, it, it is, is no. Um, I mean, clearly, we, 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 we've got some, uh, yeah, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, it's something I can follow up with. Um, we've done a bit of work on it, but we haven't brought that towards the presentation yeah. um, content. No, we appreciate you sharing. I was just um, curious. You know, a lot, of, a lot of asset presentations would have that kind of present. And a second one, which is yeah. these days, sadly, far too historical, but one might argue that uh, that the Nifty 50 were, I would assume, largely dividend generating. Uh, and so, you know, what, what's the relationships of dividends and, of course, their relative disappearance? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, and again, that would be a follow-up question. You're, you're right. I mean, dividends, yeah, that coming out of that phase of the market, dividends are a much bigger factor uh, than today. We haven't done that specific kind of correlation analysis around. Um, Dividends and performance, uh, as we haven't done that. And what, one of the challenges with you know, dealing with this data back in the 70s is, has been the relative paucity of, of data that we can pull out to analyze. I and mean, essentially, at a company level, we're working with earnings per share and revenue. Um, and one area we'd love to get into is looking more at sort of company leverage. Uh, and that's something that we look at a lot in our current process. Um, Leverage is a key kind of measure of, of risk. Um, but frustratingly, we just haven't been able to get good, clean data um, around that. Um, like, like all these history projects, there's always more you want to dig into, and, and you reach a point where your sources start letting you down. Uh, but no, that's the great thing about good research, you just keep going. 
Um, <laughs> don't we all know you're going to slap yourself and put it down? Yeah, just uh, competing <laughs> dividend yields were extremely low. I, I don't know much about the period in that sense, but I did always historically look at dividends as a, a bit like kind of going and donating blood. It proved you were a healthy individual if you just gave a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but moving on, um, a lot of people just like to close, I think, on a few things. I'm going to try and pull some comments together. I'm also getting a lot of uh, congratulations on the brilliant presentation. Uh, Kartik Patel, uh, he liked your herd investor behavior points, and he thinks it's happening now. Um, well, one area where we've definitely seen you know, that people are going and investing, buying, as you say, not based on any fundamentals anybody can discern, including themselves, is the whole cryptocurrency market. Any thoughts on this in cryptocurrencies? Yes, I mean, and again, I I, uh, I find you know I think we we I find myself very much in the skeptical camp uh, of, of of crypto while being open minded that maybe there is something new here. Um, uh, I mean, I, I other investors have written written about this extensively, um, and uh, I'm happy to. Um, Anyone who's interested towards some of the research that we found useful uh, in, in that area, informing us uh, on on the skeptical side, we have tried to look at it with an open mind, um, but but so far are definitely struggling uh, uh, with it conceptually. Okay, um, uh, Hugh Purser, did you did you look at an unweighted Nifty Fifty performance versus an unweighted S and P performance? No, we haven't done that, um, and that's uh, we we haven't sort of unweighted it. So we even we're so equally weighting every stock. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that 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 that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And kind of the final, uh, well, not quite the final question. Uh, Deepak Lawani, uh, who many of the world markets, especially the U.S., are at new all times high highs. You know, in your general opinion, are they are these bubble values? That's the big problem, is that when you're in a bubble, you can't see it, almost by definition. Yes, again, and it's it's sort of a, it, it's, it's a much much longer answer, I suppose. I and mean, I think you know, an area that we also look at, like many investors, is uh, the impact of, of stimulus, monetary and uh, fiscal, uh, on markets uh, and trying to unpick that. Um, and the, um, I suppose the get out of jail answer for an active manager is, it's no time to be passive. You've got to, you've got to be selective. Um, but uh, yeah, beyond that, I, I think certainly some traditional measures of valuation are absolutely right are are, are high points. Um, but in many cases, that, those, that has been the case for a number of years. Uh, so so unpicking that impact of um, uh, of stimulus uh, is it, really challenging, I think, for investors today. You had on one of your slides, I think it was, uh, I wrote down February 73 from Citibank, and you said it was an exchange traded fund. Was that the term that they used then, or, or did you mean you looked at it and said that yes, was the. I, I, I believe it is, I and mean, I think it's in a slightly different context to how we would see an exchange traded fund now. Um, no. But I believe that that is the language uh, that we sort of uh, we've lifted off. I will double check that point with, um, with Joseph, but I believe that is the. It's the contemporary language we've quoted. Uh, just curiosity. Well, look, I'm getting a lot of uh, congratulations in, which is, uh, and I'm happy to pass them on. Anybody wants to send more in. Uh, but uh, it's always a sign that I've kind of run over time or close to it. This has been great, Simon. And we're really sorry uh, Joseph couldn't be here to bask in the glory he deserves. Um, truly uh, a blast from the past, but as you said, you know, very much about uh, history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I believe that's Mark Twain. Uh, and that, that is so true today. I, I think Barron's editors ought to be rereading their old uh, reports for far more inspiration. And I loved uh, that quote I'm definitely taking away, which is extrapolation is the opiate of the masses. It certainly beats religion <laughs> in the modern era. Uh, so that has been absolutely super. Um, I'm just going to close, if I may, on three quick rounds of thanks. Uh, the first is uh, merely to, to say to our sponsors, thank you so much for allowing us to have such fascinating sessions. Uh, and we hope that you're proud of it. And we hope that those of you who are online enjoyed it. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank the audience today. Beautiful set of questions. They are really fit the presentation. I appreciated them. Uh, and Simon, you answered them so beautifully. 
Uh, as ever, folks, we do have a very active uh, webinar series ahead, uh, not least uh, a report that we're bringing out on Thursday, which I'd appreciate you kind of coming in. That's tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, and we're looking very much at the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're dialing in from Labuan uh, in Malaysia, who sponsored this report really on how digitalization and international financial centers uh, can make a difference. Uh, and next week, of course, we, we, we're dropping in on Old Friends in Busan, which has been a really emerging center that many people have overlooked, and I don't think they're going to be overlooking it for much longer as it's grown enormously over the last 10 years. So lots happening out there. But my biggest thanks, uh, really, Simon, is to you and, you know, uh, and behind you, Joseph, who uh, we, do, we do hope he recovers. You stepped into the breach beautifully today. Lovely presentation, well delivered, full of interesting stuff, and much for us to ponder on. Um, so I'd like to thank you for that. And I'm afraid well, thank you very much for having us. Great. I can't open the floodgates of applause, but I can say goodbye. And we hope to have you back as you do more research. This is really an uh, interesting area for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much.